Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Everybody ready? In the name of Allah, the most merciful, the bestower of mercy, we praise Allah, we seek His aid, we seek His help, we seek His forgiveness, we seek refuge in Allah. We bear witness there's nothing worthy of worship except Allah and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the last and final messenger of Allah. Jazakumullah khair for coming, inshallah. Who knows why we're here today? Are you here to listen to me? No, apologies. Yeah. We're here to listen to your sister. Okay, good. We're here to listen to your sister. Who knows her name? Yeah. Who knows her name? Sean? Anybody? Suhaima. Suhaima Manzoor Khan. Yeah, it's the young sister. She is a student of masters, a master's degree in post-colonial, yeah, post-colonial studies in SOAS University. Yeah, and she's also a writer. She, you, if you type in her name, you'll see articles in different newspapers. She's also a spoken word artist. What's a spoken word artist, Julie? Only Rumeisa. Yes, Rumeisa. Sorry, like a poet. Good. So, inshallah. Firstly, we're going to hear some words from her, inshallah, some spoken word. She done a very good one on identity, and I think it's important for all of us to come like and listen to, inshallah, especially the youngsters. And then, inshallah, she's going to say a few words and give us the opportunity to ask her some questions, inshallah. So, I'll leave, I'll leave you all with Sister Suhaim, inshallah. Thank you, Sister. Are we filming the project? Yeah, you film it. Ali's yeah. filming it as well, but she's going to film it as well. Okay. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, so, yeah, uh, as the Imam said, I'm Suhaim Manzoor Khan. I'm going to start off with a poem. Um, I want you all to listen carefully because I'm going to ask you afterwards what, what you think I was writing about, why you think I was writing it, um, and I'll give you some clues. So I wrote it in the middle of Ramadan, and the thing that had just happened was the London Bridge incident, so if you remember that. So I'll do the poem and you tell me if you <coughs> think you know what it's about. Some poems force you to write them. The way sirens force their way through window panes in the night, and you can't shut out the news even when you try. Write a humanizing poem, my pen and paper, go to me. Show them how wrong their preconceptions are. Be relatable. Write something upbeat for a change. Crack a smile. Tell them how you also cried at the end of Toy Story 3, and you're just as capable of bantering about the weather in the post office queue. Like everyone, you have no idea how to cook the perfect amount of pasta still. Feed them stories of stoic humor. Make a reference to childhood. Tell an anecdote about being so, tell an anecdote about being frugal, mention the X Factor. Be domestic, successful, add layers, tell them you know brown boys who cry about the size of Assad's, Amir's and Hassan's. They don't know the complex inner world of Samaya's and Aisha's. Tell them comedies as well as tragedies. How full of life we are, how full of love. But no, I put my pen down. I will not let that poem force me to write it because it is not the poem I want to write. It is the poem I have been reduced to. Reduced to proving my life is human because it is relatable, valuable because it is recognizable. But good GCSEs, family and childhood memories are not the only things that count as a life. Living is. So this will not be a Muslims are like us poem. I refuse to be respectable. Instead, love us when we're lazy. Love us when we're poor. Love us in our back-to-backs, council estates, depressed, unwashed and weeping. Love us high as kites unemployed, joyriding, time-wasting, failing at school, love us filthy, without the right colour passports, without the right sounding English, love us silent, unapologising, shopping in Poundland, skiving off school, homeless, unsure, sometimes violent, love us when we aren't, athletes, when we don't bake cakes, when we don't offer our homes or free taxi rides after the event, when we're wretched, suicidal, naked and contributing nothing, love us then, because if you need me to prove my humanity, I'm not the one that's not human. My mother texts me too after BBC News alerts. Are you safe? Let me know you're home okay. And she means safe from the incident, yes, but also from the after effects. So sometimes I wonder, which days of the week might I count as liberal and which moments of forehead to the ground am I conservative? I wonder, when you buy bombs, is there a clear difference between the deadly ones that kill and the heroic ones which scatter democracy? I wonder, isn't it really guilty until proven innocent? How can we kill in the name of saving lives? How can we illegally detain in the name of maintaining the law? I can't write it. I put my pen away. I can't, I won't write it. Is this radical? Am I radical? Because there is nowhere else left to exist now. Thank you.
Thanks. Does anybody have any idea what that might be about? Any of the ideas I said in there? Anyone think they, they know why I wrote that? Come on. I, I can see you guys are listening carefully. No? All right, so I'll give you a clue. So one of the key things that I'm talking about at the start is that I wanted to write this poem. Yeah, the first poem that I was telling you about that I wanted to write was about how good Muslims are, how kind the ones I know are, how um, how they are so funny, and how we're just normal like everybody else. Um, but what, what I realized when I kept trying to write that poem was that why should I have to write that poem? Why, why was the onus on me to say that I am like everybody else? You know, nobody else ever has to really do that apart from Muslims um, at the moment. And so a big part of that is because of the media images, um, the stories, um, and the way that Muslims are talked about in the media, right? So you know the kind of things I mean, very negative images, never anything positive. Um, and I think when we're talking about the role of youth um, in Islam today, I think we have to remember it's not, just, it's not just our responsibility to show good images of Muslims, right? Because I think we know we are, we are good, yeah? There are, there's the things we're doing, we're all complex people, um, just like everybody else. And I think sometimes we need to prioritize our accountability to Allah above our accountability to the media and to people and showing people. So I think what happens a lot of times is something bad happens, right? A terrorist attack, let's say. And a lot of people feel that we have to say, look, I condemn this, it's not good, I'm not like this. But I think we need to re reposition ourselves and think what, what comes of us just keeping on having to say, that's not us, we, don't, we didn't do that, we don't agree with that. It's not really changing much, us just saying that. So I think it's important for us to also try and focus on our own inner inner selves and focus on each other and caring about each other. So that's what the second bit of my poem is about, right? So lovers, yeah? Lovers when we're lazy, lovers when we're poor, lovers in all these different scenarios. One of the things that I'm getting at is that I think the way that we think about love in this, in this country, in this society, is very reductive, yeah? Um, I think, in my mind, in Islam, the way that, that love is, is very unconditional, yeah? Islam is a, is, a, is a religion that has to be within a society. Yeah, you have to you have to have other people that you interact with to be able to do many of the tenets of Islam. So, I kind of think that the way that we think about love needs to be a bit more unconditional. We need to see people on the street that aren't necessarily Muslim, that aren't necessarily our friends or our neighbours, and we need to think, I care about you as well, and I, and I hope that you care about me in the same way. So that's why I'm talking about the houses that we live in. Yeah, back to backs, council estates. I'm talking about the uh, unemployment. So a report came out today and it said that um, Muslims in this country are, I think, three times more likely to be unemployed than non-Muslims. Um, I think we live in some of the worst housing in the UK. We um, are very un underqualified compared to many people in the UK. We find it much harder to get jobs. And I'm not just saying all these things to complain, right? What I think is important is that in Islam, justice is a really important tenet, yeah? It's the idea that you have to work for justice, whether it's against yourselves, against your parents, against the people that you love and know, or against, what, so whether you are the oppressor or whether someone else is the oppressor, you have to work for justice. And I think something that's useful that we can all do as, as young people is to think about, not just in the sense of what do Muslims need, but what do people in this society need? Because a lot of the things that we need are things that are tied up with other poor people, other people of color. Um, other, you know, people living in um, bad housing that, and so we need to kind of see a solidarity between each other and say, well look, do you see how the government cutting funding is affecting all of us, yeah? You might not think that's, you might, it might be easier to say, oh, you know, Muslims just get a bad deal in this country and we're not kind of seen in a hu human way, which is true, but so are other people in this country and we need to recognize them, see them and talk, this, this unconditional love, yeah, we need to see them and say, look, I'm going to work with you. I think we all need to be fighting against this government. We need to be, when people are talking about the NHS and those kind of things, we can't switch off because those things are also related to us and our welfare in this country. So I think it's very easy to feel like, oh, Muslims just represented badly. We don't want anything to do with what's going on. Um, the final thing that I talk about is um, to, you know, I say like, um, what's the difference between bombs that are heroic and deadly? Um, how can we legally detain in the name of maintaining the law? So I'm talking about people who are sent to prison for no reason, yeah? Um, or the reason that is given is that they're sent to prison to protect other people. 
But we know about a lot of cases, of particularly Muslims who are just sent to prison um, on no real solid basis. So we know about Guantanamo Bay, for example. You know, a lot of people in there, there's been no evidence um, of the crimes that they've committed or that they've been said that they've committed. And so that reminds us that we're living in a situation where Muslims are seen as criminal, yeah, even when they haven't done anything. And so I think what's important for us to think about them is to, and the job of the youth, is that we have to be clever, okay? We have to be really clever and think about what are the things that are being told to us and are they necessarily true? Are we necessarily criminal? Are people who go to prison necessarily criminal? And I think the more we think about that, the more we begin to understand things. So for example, you know how the media is very interested in Muslim women, yeah? Um, what Muslim women wear, how they dress, what they do, um, you know, all sorts of different, you know, the, the kind of, there's always these questions about Muslim women. Well, we have to be clever and we have to say, does this government actually care about Muslim women? It doesn't seem so. Does this, does this government actually care about women? It doesn't seem so. But what happens is, the Muslim woman just becomes this figure that we talk about, this symbol, yeah? And it's a good symbol because you can say, oh, Muslim men are evil because look how oppressed the Muslim woman is. But we don't talk to the Muslim woman, we don't let her say how she really feels. Um, and I think what we have to understand is that this is a big part of the, the government in this country not actually having to deal with its own problems. So this is what I'm talking about. Being clever is about trying to understand why are people always talking about Muslims and what are they not talking about when they're talking about Muslims? So for example, so there's this, I think there's this kind of like this joke thing at the moment, which is that, oh, Britishness, no one can define it, ha ha ha. Um, but I think people can define it, because the way they define it is that being British is something that Muslims aren't, right? Muslims are some, it's always, there was that TV show um, a while back called Muslims Like Us, right? And that very title was like, Muslims couldn't be us, yeah? It was, they were just like us, they couldn't, they couldn't be us. And so, and that whole idea of Britishness, I think, is really important and interesting to think about. Here I'm talking again about being clever, asking questions, right? Why are people always talking about Britishness and why are they always saying Muslims can't be British? Well, because if Muslims were to be British, which we know we are, right? I think, I think this is the, the kind of fundamental irony of it, is that actually, we, if you've grown up here, yeah, like me, then we are British, right? Um, but the scary thing to the government and to the state is that if we are British, and how, how can they how can they scapegoat things like sexism onto Muslims? How can they scapegoat things like violence onto Muslims? They can't because they have to admit that this society is also violent, not just Muslims. So I have another short poem about that, um, and then I'll kind of wrap up because I know you guys are all kind of tired. Um, so have, have you guys ever seen that word that gets used about Muslims in the media? It says British born. Anyone ever seen that? Anyone ever heard that word? So they say British born, yeah, rather than British. I think that's really interesting. So this is just a short poem about that. Paper says British born. Like that's all it is, just an accident. They rubbed out British raised, desperately trying to deflect. Erasing the context and connection, the fact this society made him, this land, this place, our words, our harm. But he's British born, not British. British never British. They pretend the birthplace is somehow random, place his motives in a foreign land. Must be the fact of his grandparents' blood, must be the fact of his skin. What a welcome from the heart of the empire, Raj of the Raj, a massive thumbs up from the hand which sliced us. British born, not British made, foreign goods somewhere deep inside. I am British born, British passport, but neon hijab and signposted skin. Scanner goes off, obviously. A woman feels over me and looks straight through me. Random swabs are made. I am unmade. Passport says British. Her eyes say British born only. So, as you can see, that one's also about this whole thing of, I think, we have to be clever because if we really think about why people are talking about British why they're talking about Muslims, what they're trying to say is that problems like violence, yeah, are not their problem, it's a problem of Muslims. So you say that violence is something that happens in Muslims' heads, something we can't understand, and then we say that this society, therefore, doesn't have to be responsible. The government doesn't have to be responsible. Society, welfare, we don't have to worry about people being poor. We don't have to increase um, accountability. We don't have to change our foreign policy. Um, so I'll just end by saying that, I guess, my final piece of advice, especially to the young people in this room, is that um, we don't have to waste our energy, right? We don't have to waste our energy on always responding, always trying to prove ourselves. We also can just turn to each other and say, I see you fully, and I know what you're going through. 
and I respect that, and we don't need to waste our time responding, responding, responding. There's a really famous um, black feminist from the 70s and 80s, and she's Toni Morrison, she's called, and she said that one of the important functions of racism is distraction, that distracting people saying, hey, um, prove this, prove Muslims aren't violent, um, prove Muslims are this, aren't that, you know, why do you oppress your women? All these kind of sidetracking questions mean that we then don't get time to focus on the important questions, which are, why in this society are we three times more likely to be unemployed? Why in this society are we in the worst housing, etc., etc.? Um, so I leave you, yeah, with the final message of just, our, the only thing we have to do is submit to Allah, right? That's all we have to do. Um, I think with that comes the responsibility to other people, not just to Allah, because the responsibility to other people is justice. We have, we have responsibility to be just to ourselves, so kind of fulfilling the wishes of our soul, submission, submission to Allah, but also um, justice to others in this society and recognizing that our justice is bound up with others and the justice which also means we expose and reveal the oppression um, that people put upon us. Thank you so much. Zala Khair to Sister Suhaima, a beautiful spoken word performances and also some good discussion inshallah from her. So just quick points firstly before inshallah uh, Imam Ashraf to say a few words as well. And number one for the youngsters, uh, question, why do you think I invited Sister Suhaima to visit you today? Ramesis. Yeah, yeah right. Oh, because like to help like understand more about like, what she's saying mm -hmm. and make us like think like we're not different compared to other people. Yeah, so very important. I mean in terms of her message so for you to get that confidence that you are as good as, as equal as anybody. And you don't need to prove yourself. You just need to be, you just need to be normal. Yeah? Live in society as normal and that's it. Yeah, Because nobody else is required to do that. Why should you? So once you accept that narrative, well, look, I've got to prove myself, already you're inferior. Yeah, why else? Ramesh, you want to say something? Prove yeah. your identity. Okay, yeah, prove your identity. But a key issue for youngsters, like this, right? she's, she's, she's young. She's a student. She's a student in Soros University studying masters. What did I say? Post-colonial studies. That's what she's looking into. Yeah. Okay. So, for youngsters to be able to contribute towards the well-being of Muslim society, like she's doing. Yeah. So, all of you need to ask yourself, the youngsters especially, what can I do? Yeah. And everybody. What did I mention in Juma? Everybody is a role. Model. Yeah. What did I say? Yeah, go on, Zain. I was here in Jamaica. You wasn't here, okay. <laughs> Everybody has a role. It could be you're a spoken word artist. Could be you're a football player. Could be you're a teacher. Could be you're an imam. Could be you're a scholar. Could be you're a professor. Everybody has a role responsibility. Other things, especially for the girls. Yeah, what do you think? Well, why, why did we invite a sister today? Yeah, why do you think that? Hmm? Yeah, go on. Um, so like... Have a go, have a go. You know when you're in school and stuff, do men always speak for you? Mm -hmm. Don't they ask you about your hijab and they question you? They don't question you? Inshallah you go to a good school. Yeah? Nobody gets that? In the same way, a young man or a man has to have you know, his contribution to society in the same way women have to, Muslim women have to play their part in society. The message of Rabbi Allah, what they say? And Nisa, shaka'at kur rijal. Women are like the twin halves of men. Yeah, in terms of what is obligation for a man, is obligation for a woman, and so on. Yeah, and each one plays a part. Like Khadija, عنها, she played a part. Our mother, the wife of the Prophet, Aisha, عنها, the wife of the Prophet, our mother, she played a part and other prominent Sahabia played their part in society, same way you as Muslim women need to play your part, inshallah. So inshallah, just uh, Sheikh Ashraf, remember Sheikh Ashraf is a new Imam at the Lushim Islamic Center, he joined us this week, he started. Inshallah, just a few words on uh, for youth, yeah? what's their role and responsibility, Sheikh Ashraf? Yeah, brother. Bismillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'i. Before talking about the youth, talk a little bit about poetry as poetry was something which was um, used by the Arabs as well before the coming of the Prophet the Arabs were 
very were talented in poetry, and it was something with which the Arabs could destroy that entire society. If one tribe were to write a poem about another tribe, and this tribe were to have been uh, spoken about in, in an ill manner, and were this poem to be of uh, very good uh, and sound uh, structure, and according to the rulings of, of poetry in the Arabic language, this poet, poem could actually destroy the whole tribe. It could humiliate the tribe for, for, for years to come. And you find that in Western society as well, poetry has, has had a major impact in society. Whenever peoples are fighting for their, their rights and fighting for, for freedom, poetry has always been a means of expression. You find, for example, um, spoken word, spoken word poetry, and hip hop, if you, if you were to look into the history of hip hop, hip hop came about as a type of political speech for the oppressed, political speech for those that were, were being oppressed by the American government. And so writing is something which is extremely important for the youth. Putting our pens to paper and trying to write, trying to express ourselves, bettering our understanding of the English language, bettering our understanding of the language that we can communicate to others with. And so, for example, some of our youth here today, they may be able to put their pen to paper and write some amazing poetry. And so we should try it. Try to express ourselves. You could write an amazing piece of poetry, stand up in school, and, 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 and express yourself in front of your whole community. And this could change many hearts. And there are many prominent um, Muslim poets throughout history, uh, both Western and, and uh, Eastern and Asian. Wherever you look, you find that poetry has been held in high esteem by all nations and all types of people. And so it's important that we start to put our pens to paper and put some poetry down and start to express ourselves for the people. Um, and you find even in, for example, the UK music and, and American music, you find elements of, of, of Islamic uh, language being used now because of the Muslims now have, have started to mix so much with, with, with those around them that we're starting to influence those that are involved in, in uh, you could say, UK poetry, although it has elements of music in it. So imagine if we were to develop our own, our own Islamic poetry, our own Islamic uh, form of media, form of expression. And it's something for the youth to do. When you go home tonight, put your pen to paper and come up with something. And perhaps Imam Shakib can let some of the young brothers read the poetry out in the masjid. It's, a, it's a, a good idea, inshallah. And secondly, just to um, elaborate on some of the things that was mentioned by the sister, that we are not a reactionary people. When someone insults us, we do not react. Why? Because the Prophet Sallallahu came with a revolutionary religion. Islam is a religion of revolution. It changes the whole concept of, of society <coughs> as, as known to that society. Wherever Islam places itself, things start to change. And if you look what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about the Prophet sallam, He said that you are what? Rahmatan lil'alameen You are mercy for the whole of mankind Not just for the Muslims And so when we're outside and we are mixing with the non-Muslim people We have to see ourselves as a mercy for them And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed us in this society as a mercy for those non-Muslims Why? To take them from the darkness of, of non-belief to the light of Islam And to, uh, if you were to go through all of the the, the blessings of Islam, whether social blessings, academic blessings, um, spiritual blessings, you'll find that Islam is what the people of the world are in need of today. And so we should stand up proud and say, I'm a Muslim, and I can offer you something. We should stand up, especially the youth, we should stand up and say, I'm a Muslim, and I have a lot to offer you. So hear my voice, and we should start to express ourselves. أنا عند الوزاء وصل الله مع سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. سلام خير الشيخ أشرف إن شاء الله ودا we want to conclude and we want to just conclude with dua for with dua for our sister Sister Suhaima may Allah Taala Subhanahu Wa Taala reward her for coming down today. Keep in mind it's a small gathering. Yeah, this is a first Friday halakha. Weather's not too good. You generally get a good crowd. But the sister, if you type in her name Suhaima Manzur Khan, spoken word. You will see her performing in front of non-Muslims. How many non-Muslims are there, sister? Six hundred in that room. Six hundred. Oh. Imagine, yeah, if you say what she's saying in front of six, seven, eight hundred non-Muslims, and they hear the message that she's giving. That's when change really takes place. Yeah. 
because they need to understand what we go through and what our identity is about. Yeah, so please, inshallah, we pray Allah Ta'ala rewards her, Allah Ta'ala keeps her steadfast, Allah Ta'ala, inshallah, uh, uses her as a tool to spread the message of Islam, and to spread, inshallah, justice upon earth. And inshallah, wise sister, you'll be on your own speaking in many places, inshallah, that our two hours will be with you, and in our spirit, inshallah, will be there supporting you, inshallah. With that, we conclude. Subhanakallah, wa bihamdik, ashadu wa la ilaha ant, as-salaamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.